Welcome, families, to another episode of Thriving Special Families. I'm your host, Crystal Sanford, your autism and IEP advocate. And I am so honored to be here today with my special guest, J.R. Reed. Hi, J.R. How you doing, Crystal? It's doing so great. And I am so excited about today's episode. So today, families, our episode topic is Before Autism Was a Thing. So JR has a, a life's worth of experience as a self-advocate, and we will hear more about his experience as an adult on the autism spectrum. Uh, for families who are listening to our podcast, welcome to the Thriving Special Families family. Uh, you are in the right place because this show is our show where we offer insight, humor, and hope for families parenting children with unique needs. If you are watching us live, Thank you for watching. Feel free to add your questions or comments to the comment section, and we'll do our best to answer those live for you today. And so, you want to say nice things about me too in the, in the comments below. Feel free to say wonderful things about JR. <laughs> he is awesome. Uh, I was telling uh, JR before this that this has been one of the most um, episodes that I've been looking forward to the most. I love doing this show, but I always love having uh, individuals who can share from their own personal experience. Um, and JR is is phenomenal. And so I'm so glad to have you here today. And, and I'm happy to be here. It's a, it's a trip back to Southern California without the sensory overload. Awesome. Yes, I'm so glad that we're able to provide that for you. Um, so let me share a little bit about J.R. J.R. Reed is an autism advocate who preaches neurodiversity and does it all from a log cabin in the Missouri Ozarks. J.R. blogs, speaks, and writes on a wide variety of topics affecting adults with developmental disabilities. He's spoken to groups, companies, and at the Missouri State Capitol. You can find out more about JR and you can see his writings on his website, which is not weird, just autistic.com. And I love that title. Love that. I've actually done a presentation that's uh, then that's that title. Um, Your child's not weird. They, they are just have autism, you know? Um, so, um, and hey, to those who are watching, Christopher, Jeanette, so glad to have you with us today. Um, so JR, tell us uh, just a little bit about your autism story. Well, I was born in the mid 60s um, and I had graduated high school about 13 years before autism as we know it began being diagnosed in children. And it was several years later before it was diagnosed in adults. Uh, I went through school beginning in fifth grade, being called weird, stupid, and lazy by teachers in front of my classmates. Um, my classmates became a little more colorful, so there was no uh, special ed, there was no accommodations. Um, great example was my high school algebra teacher, who I got all the answers to the, to the test questions right, but I showed the work in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I got D minuses because he didn't want me back in his class a second time. Wow. Um, you know, he just, he couldn't understand the way I did it. I couldn't understand the way he taught it. And yeah. that stigmatized me for a long, long time. And now I really want nothing to do with math. Yeah. Um, it's terrible, you know, and especially we're seeing this now with Common Core, some of that same thing. Here we are, how many years later? Um, you know, every kid doesn't learn that way. And, and I've had my daughter tell me so many times, mom, the answer is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like she can do it in her head. Yeah. She's got to draw pictures and diagrams and all this stuff to show the same thing she already knows. And it's irritating to her to have to do that when she already knows the answer. So well, th things have changed, but they haven't changed. Right, right. Weird, stupid, and lazy has been replaced by sped kids. Yeah, yeah. And I will tell you what, I have talked to teachers and administrators and told them that when you call somebody a sped kid, which is short for special, special education, mm -hmm. that that will stick with them their entire life and that will make them feel terrible. Right. Um, you know that there's coexisting conditions with autism, such as anxiety and mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. And I, I firmly believe that a lot of those are environmental. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that a lot of the reason that I suffer from depression and anxiety 
is because of stuff like that is being called weird, stupid, and lazy mm -hmm. most of my life. I had a boss that called me Forrest Gump every working day for 10 years. Oh, it's just, it's just devastating. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so, it's hard to hear, but it's just, um, yeah. you would think that people would be more aware, be more conscious, especially people in leadership positions, yeah. but it's not always the case. But, you know, I, I, I thought about going to another job, but I, I took the approach of it's better to stick with the devil you know than the devil you don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I knew he was trying to be funny and not mean, mm. even though he was. Right. You know, but I, I, I knew what his intent was. Yeah. yeah. And I, I felt lucky just to have a job because, as I, I'm sure you know, more than 80% of adults on the spectrum are unemployed or underemployed. So I just felt lucky to have a job. Yeah, that's so sad, but true. It's it's exactly right. One of those unfortunate statistics is true. Yeah. Um, and so what led you from that experience to now becoming, you know, uh, a guest speaker, a business owner? How, how did you make that transition? Well, when I was about 43 or 44, I started looking into why I did the strange things I did. The biggest example I can show is for 13 years, I covered the Anaheim Ducks for different newspapers, for different magazines, different websites. Mm -hmm. And that was sensory overload. I mean, being in an NHL arena filled with 18,000 people, all the noise in a crowded press box, elbow to elbow. Yeah. I literally had to go outside between every period and just get the fresh air and get mm -hmm. away from it. Mm -hmm. Um so I started thinking about why I had to do those kind of things. I thought autism was possibly a reason, but I wasn't one of those people that said, yes, I'm autistic. Mm -hmm. um, my psychologist actually one day asked me if I thought I might be, and I said, yes. The next week he tested me and told me that I had Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking out to my car thinking, wow, I'm not weird, just autistic. Wow, And that phrase has stuck with me for the rest of my life and really became the cornerstone of the next chapter of my life, which was the advocacy. That's amazing. That's amazing how you were able to, once you were able to put a name on it, you know, once you were able yeah. to understand, then it yeah. just, it really turned your life around. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it was an epiphany. It was like the heavens mm -hmm. opened up and I was happy. Mm -hmm. And you don't think of a whole lot of people who find out that they're autistic thinking that they're happy, but right. I had a name. I had a reason. Now I could look and see why I was the way I was and what I could do about it. Wow. That's so powerful. You know, and that just makes me think about a question that so many parents have is, you know, do I tell my child? When do I tell my child? You know, and for us personally, I, it, as I said, uh, parents, if you're just joining us, uh, we're here in another episode of Thriving Special Families. And uh, our topic today is before autism was a thing. And we're gaining insight from an autism self-advocate, J.R. Reed. Um, and so, you know, my daughter is, I'm an advocate. I'm a special needs parent. I'm a speech pathologist. Um, and my daughter is 10. She's on the spectrum. And we have probably since for the past four years, um, use the name, we say, you know, autism. I mean, before that it was, you know, your brain works differently, you know, there's, you know, right. we're different. Right. Uh, we actually, you know, put a name to it. Um, right. And she is, you know, one of her own best self-advocates, I think, because that she's very quick to tell somebody, oh, well, you know, I have autism. That's why this is hard for me. Or, you yeah. know, this is why I can't focus because, you know, I have ADHD. I mean, she'll say that. And right. I think it's very empowering to her to be able to have a name for that and exactly. understand, yeah. Well, you know, the way I like to explain it, and, and this is a way that she can explain it too, is that we're like Max in a PC world. We <laughs> have different software and a different operating system, oh, but at the end of the day, we're both gonna get the job done. I like that, ooh, that's awesome. I'm gonna use that one. I'm gonna well, take I'll that. give it to you. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, parents, if you're uh, joining us live, feel free to add your uh, questions or comments to the uh, comment section. We'll do our best to answer them. Um, we have Christopher here who says that he totally gets you when it comes to math. Like it's um, it's tough. And especially in your situation where you had that, um, you know, that teacher that uh, you know, was. Well, yeah, I can tell you that I, I know Christopher Casson. Christopher Casson is an excellent excellent autism self-advocate, uh, visual artist, podcaster, and um, he, he's just an awesome guy. Oh my gosh. Well, he sounds like uh, a ne the next guest for my show. How about that? Um, and then again, we have Peggy who's watching. She says, you know, change is hard. And again, you would think, you know, in 2021, um, you know, there should should not be as much struggle. And, and over the years, you would think. But, you know, here we are doing things like this, having this show um, that brings light to, uh, you know, the beauty of neurodiversity and autism. You know, the thing is, for so many years, we've been promoting autism awareness. Mm -hmm. But I think now we're at the point where we need to really start pushing autism acceptance. Yes, yes. And that's been huge this year, just this year, really, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of the things that I've seen so far as advertisement and, and, and promoting it this month in April um, has been uh, moving toward acceptance because, you yeah. know, and I, I can think about, I, I've said this to my child's school. I said, kids with autism aren't going anywhere. If not, if nothing else, there's going to be more of them coming down the pike. So you guys need to oh, yeah. figure out how to get it together, how to, how to support these kids, how to include them as part of the community and serve them well, because they're coming <laughs> and they deserve to be, you know, a part of the community, just like anyone else. 15 years ago, CDC had it as one in 150. Yeah. And as of 2020, it's down to one in 54. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it's coming down. Yeah. It, we, we are more prevalent than they think. And you got to remember, too, that it's not just the people on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's the families. It's yes. the, you know, people that are the significant others, significant others. Mm -hmm. It's the close friends. Right. You know, they're all affected by being on the spectrum as well. Very true. Very true. And and that leads me to, to one of my questions uh, for you is that, you know, what have you seen in autism over the years as an individual, uh, you know, on the spectrum yourself? Uh, I think the main thing that's changed is research. Okay. Like I said, I was, you know, called weird, stupid and lazy. Now they're called sped kids, you know, so that really hasn't changed in the way that they're treated. Mm -hmm. But Judy Singer's doctoral thesis on the neurodiversity paradigm in 1998 really, I think, is what changed a lot of the way people look at autism. And, uh, you know, we don't have time to talk about that here, but you can definitely look that up. Um, Milton's double empathy paradigm showing that we really do have empathy. We just don't mm -hmm. understand people that are neurotypical and neurotypicals don't understand us as well. Right. Um, you know, again, that's research. Mm -hmm. So I think research has changed a lot in the way that we view autism. Mm -hmm. That's great. And that is that has been a, a plus. You know, I know that there are many uh, universities that are doing some great things out there mm -hmm. when it comes to research. Um, you know, something else here that Christopher has added, he says that autism doesn't fade with age, it is lifelong. And that's... Yeah. That's an interesting point as well, because I think sometimes, you know, and there are other proponents who will say, my kid is no longer autistic or, you know, we've done you know X, Y, Z, and now they're not on the spectrum anymore. Um, right. What would you say to that? I'll, I'll say this at, at age 55, I will say that there are a few of my traits that I think have gotten more significant with age. Wow. Wow. More you know, I think I'm more susceptible to the sensory overload than I might have been 20 years ago. Mm. So I think there may be some things that fade with age, mm -hmm. but there also can be some things that get more severe with age. Wow. Wow. That's really good for us to know. Those of us who are caregivers, who are friends, yeah. who um, you know, who interact with, with these, with individuals, yeah. that well, it shifts, it changes. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's Dr. Stephen Shore the only mm -hmm. autistic professor of autism in the United States 
said, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism, meaning there are hundreds of traits that we could have, but, and there's a lot of overlapping traits, mm -hmm. but you'd be hard pressed to find two people with exactly the same traits. And oh my God, a squirrel just ran up my wall. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that squirrel. Really, I just saw something out of the corner of my eye and realized, oh my god, there's a squirrel running up my outside wall. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh, he wants to hear the interview too. Maybe I don't know. Apparently, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Well, again, families, if you're uh, just joining us, here we are with another episode of Thriving Special Families, sponsored by Sanford Autism Consulting. Your and ADHD. <laughs> and sponsored by that. We've got a lot, a lot of stuff going on here um, at Sanford Autism uh, because I live it every day as a parent of a child on the spectrum, as a speech pathologist for over 20 years and as an advocate. And I help families to um, advocate for the education that their child deserves. So feel free to give us a call if you need some support in the IEP area. Um, but back to our interview, you know, JR, uh, as a, you're a parent yourself, actually. Yes, I am. Uh, and your daughter is... 23, 24 Oh my gosh, amazing. And, and I have full custody of her since she was five. And I, I will say that, you know, being a single parent um, of a non-autistic child, it was tough. So I can only imagine what it's like for the parent of a child on the spectrum. That's amazing. That makes me think about, you know, the genetics of hearing loss and like a parent who is a hearing parent raising a child who is deaf or vice versa. I, I, I can mm -hmm. imagine a similar kind of an experience um, yeah. because you're living life so differently than your child. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and imagine me not knowing for so many years until she was yeah. a sophomore in high school. Wow. Before I found out that I was on the spectrum. Wow. Wow. Amazing. So I didn't know why I did the strange, crazy things that I was doing until mm -hmm. she was a sophomore. Wow. But as doing an excellent job because I'm sure she's doing well and, and you guys. Yeah. Are <laughs> uh, you know what? She's married. She's got a good job and she's happy. So that's really what counts. That's all you can ask for. That's beautiful. Um, and so another uh, one of our audience listeners, do you have any training um, that you offer, JR? Uh, this is one of our uh, faithful listeners and, and viewers who's watching us from Puerto Rico. I, you know, I actually do. Um, I'm going to put it up on my website this week. I'm actually meeting with someone this afternoon to start talking about it. I am going to do um, consulting with parents, uh, mainly of teens and young adults, mm -hmm. but working with them on problems they may have with the family or helping them set up a plan for life after high school or the college years. You know, because, and as I'm sure you know, and you see, so many of them graduate from high school and they want to go out and get an apartment, yeah. but then you ask them, do you have a car? No. Mm -hmm. Do you have a job? No. Do you use public transportation or know how to use public transportation? No. Right. Well, then let's set up a plan so you can do these things, mm -hmm. you know, and get you the interview skills and, yeah. you know, and help you with that. Yeah, that's beautiful. That was the piece that I used to love doing when I was a speech pathologist in the high school. I was there for four years and I loved that piece, prepping kids for the interview, prepping them for mm -hmm. asking somebody on a date. I mean, all that, all that, the social nuances, mm -hmm. the communication skills that you need to be successful in right. addition to your knowledge, right? So the right. soft skills, you really need that. Right. Well, it, it, and if they go to not we're just autistic at the bottom of every page, there's a, a sign up for a newsletter. Okay. And if they sign up for the newsletter, they will get info on, on when all that will start and they can use the contact page. I always say it's there for a reason. Why not use it? You know, yeah, that's it. That's it. I love it. I love it. Um, we have another uh, viewer who's just so proud of you. Uh, Thank you, Em. Yes. Awesome. Um, and then another question here, what impact does autism have for parents? And that's the next topic I wanted to talk about is uh, what advice and support do you have for parents like myself who are parenting children on the spectrum? Well, okay. First off, to answer her question, I, I think that is an individual case by case basis. Yeah. I think it depends on the child and the parent and how they they look at autism in their child. Mm -hmm. If they look at 
the medical model, which says these are the deficits your child has, and these are the things your child will never do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a much tougher time. Right. If they look at the neurodiversity paradigm, which is mainly pushed and written about by self-advocates and parent advocates, mm -hmm. and even some researchers that are a little more enlightened mm -hmm. than others, then they will talk about what our strengths are and what we can do. So the one thing I will say is never, ever, ever tell your child that there is nothing they can't do. Mm -hmm. Because if they sit around all day playing video games, well, 20 years ago, that could not have helped them. Right. Today, they can make bank <laughs> playing video games as a living. Yeah. Um, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates have never been formally diagnosed mm -hmm. as on the spectrum, but it is generally accepted that they're both on the spectrum. Right. What would have happened to our technology today had their moms told them to stop tinkering with the crap in their garage? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. let them have their hobbies, let them have their quirks. Um, everybody on the spectrum tends to have a special interest. Mm -hmm. Mine is comic books. Okay. I'm a writer. I don't write comic books, but if a kid is really into comic books, superheroes, things like that, mm -hmm. who knows that, you know, if they're not going to be the next great writer for Marvel or DC. Right. You don't or if they're an artist, yeah. you know, um, let me actually just grab this. And this was done by a 12 year old nonverbal autistic boy. Wow. Um, the uh, URL is vichys, V I C H Y S art.com. Mm. He creates some incredible art. He can't communicate with his mouth, mm. but he can communicate with a paintbrush. There you go. Wow. So, you know what? That's what I, that's the thing for the parents that say that their kids can't. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. That's so good. Let me tell you, my daughter has told me, you know, so many different things she's interested in. And I'm always like, what is it now? What is it now? Because that's going to be a thing and we're going to make sure. And I think one thing that parents are starting to do is um, they're starting to develop these micro businesses with their you know, young adult, uh, you know, mm -hmm. That whatever developmental disability. Um, I know there's a, a, a young man here who bakes and he bakes cookies and he's on the autism spectrum and that's his thing. And he has a business that does that. And so um, I think so, delving into, instead of always trying to stop them, like you said, from doing their preferred interests, diving into that, especially as they get into their, you know, teen years and, and adult years, because that could very well be the thing that they um, use as a career, um, you know, it, it can become a job, it could become a volunteer opportunity. Um, so yeah, that, that's great, great advice. One of the phrases I heard so much as a child, when I had special interest or things that I was really interested in is, oh, stop it, just uh, yeah. stop it, stop yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't want to stop it. Right. And at 55 years old, I got enough comic books to prove I never did stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but it hasn't stopped you from being a successful, thriving adult, you know? And so your parents hear this, your kid can have a special interest and still thrive. Let me tell you. Um, uh, and and that, that special interest can be, can be a, a really uh, motivating force. I'm sure. Um, what other uh, tips do you have for parents? Look at the behavior that you think is strange in your child and instead try to turn it around and look at how it can be a benefit. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we just kind of talked about, you know, with, you know, the interest in, in comic books, say, or in technology and fooling around with stuff or baking yeah. or art or, yeah. you know, whatever, mm -hmm. let them do their thing. And like we were talking about before the show, the most important thing when I talk to groups of parents mm -hmm. is I always say this, never ever forget me time. Yeah. Because <laughs> having me time is so important yes. because if you are not the best self you can be, you're going to be frazzled 
and it will come out with your child. Yeah. You won't mean to, Yeah. but it will come out with your child. Yeah. So you as a caregiver have to take that me time. That is so, so important. That's so true. You know, and we did a series here of, of episodes on uh, care for caregivers. And the last one was um, care, care for care, caregivers this month. And it was the autism edition. It was two other autism moms and myself talking about that very topic. It's so important as a parent anyway, but definitely as a parent of a child with unique needs to take that time away. Like you said, to refresh, just like they tell you on the airplane, put on your mask first before you, you know, take care and help your child. And we've got to do that on, on a daily basis. Find a way to do that. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I will say this, that um, as an adult, I have had a very hard time with dating because people here are, and, and well, for me, women, but, you know, it, it can be any, any gender. Um, mm -hmm. They hear the word autistic or autism mm -hmm. and they bolt. And I think it's because of fear, because right. they don't understand. And as we said earlier, they fear what they don't understand. Exactly. I've recently had one date with somebody who knows I'm autistic, who is very okay with it, mm -hmm. have a second date, and she's wonderful and accepts me as I am. Wow. So, I mean, who knows, who knows where that's going to go? Right. Take it day by day, one step at a time. Mm -hmm. But... You know, I mean, there are people out there for us. Right. That's wonderful. You know, and that that uh, speaks to uh, what Christopher shared here um, is that when often when people hear the word autism, they tend to focus on the label rather than the person behind the label. And you, you've experienced that, unfortunately, yourself. Christopher, that is why I love you, brother. <laughs> it's, you it's and I are on the same page. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, I just, it, and again, I can only experience, talk from my mom experiences, but um, my kiddo had an asthma attack and she used to have them more frequently, unfortunately, when she was younger. And we were in the hospital in the middle of the night in the ER, no, in, in the hospital room. And, you know, they ask you these questions about your child. And so I added on there that she was on the autism spectrum. Well, Lord have mercy, why did I do that? All of a sudden, they started, like, talking slower to my daughter and looking at her. And I'm like, oh my, I didn't tell you she was deaf. I just said she's at autism. Yeah. Just yeah. Talk, all of a sudden, they ju it just changed the game and how they interacted with her. And I was just... I, um, I, I've had the same experiences in the ER, and I, I just tell them, I said, you know what? I'm not deaf. I'm not stupid. Oh, my God. Just talk to me. That's it. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. But I do um, hope the best for you as it comes to, to that uh, realm and relationships and all that good thing, because um, more people, I think as we get information out there, people won't, like you said, be afraid. It won't be so much of an unknown, and, and people will have, you know... Um, wide open hearts and, and minds when it comes to individuals with autism. Well, it, I think that's really what it is, is just having an open mind mm -hmm. and looking at the person. And as Christopher said, not the label. Right. Yes. Wow. You know, I could talk to you all day, but I'm going to try to um, get us uh, here as we're getting to the end of our episode. Uh, another question here uh, uh, from Malona. Uh, she has said she is an actual, she's a therapist in, in Puerto Rico. She says that her client is 18 years old and she understands her environment. She communicates through her iPhone. Um, so I guess she, this is probably maybe a, a minimally speaking, non-speaking. Yeah, that, that's what I would assume. Yeah. And so she is addicted to toys. She doesn't really play with them. She just likes to hold them. Is it possible for her to take away the toys? Whoa. It's possible. <laughs> um, I think you would have to try it slowly mm -hmm. and just see what works. Okay. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I, I, I'm going to tell you something that I don't tell a whole lot of people. Uh, I sleep with a Black Panther teddy bear. Oh, love you know? that. Um, it, it, it's okay to have your toys. It's okay yeah. to have your things. Yeah. You know, it's not just a little kid with his blankie. Right. You know, oh, yeah. we all have things that make us feel secure, that make us feel safe. Mm -hmm. um, if she wants to have those, then that's that's okay. Yeah. 
uh, you should see my desk. <laughs> Being a comic book nerd, I've got all kinds of superheroes and, and, and stuff like that. So <laughs> hey, whatever helps you make it through the day. Everybody, right. like you said, has something. <laughs> and I got Albert right behind me, always always keeping me happy. <laughs> there you go. I, love it. I, love it. I, I noticed that first thing I saw when yeah. I was like, that's awesome. Um, you know, also, I think also believed to be on the spectrum, by the way. Yes. Yes. And genius. You know, one thing I think about with that question, you know, taking away those preferred items. I remember a young lady that I worked with in middle school um, with, and she had autism and they try to do kind of a slow fade for her. She would always carry around a specific DVD and some other little like paper cutouts or something. And so mm -hmm. she would try to do a slow fade. They try to say, well, you can you have to leave it here at lunchtime and then you can come back and get it after lunch. And so they try to do some kind of a fading for her. Um, you know, I know for other uh, young uh, people, they carry something in their pocket versus mm -hmm. bigger things. So something that can be easily, you know, put in the pocket, but they still have an item. Or it's uh, a preferred jacket or a piece of clothing. Right. Yes. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. That can be easily integrated into their day and not, not get in the right. way, but they still have a comfort item. Although that could be sensory as well. Oh, well, that's true. It could be the, the feel of it. That's right. There could yeah. be some, so many different reasons why. Yeah. Um, yeah. I you talk about the stuffed animals. My daughter, I often wonder, um, where is she in her bed at night? Because she's got like, I don't know how many stuffed animals and figurines, all those things. And anyway, but then many of them have to be in the bed with her when she sleeps. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like, well, if she if she's found a way to get comfortable in there with all that going on, so be it. Because she sleeps through the night, no issues. And I know that that can be an issue for a lot of our kiddos. So I'm like, fine, works for her. <laughs> I, I would tell parents to ask this question: How does it really affect things in the big picture? Yes. It doesn't. All right. So we have um, just a little uh, bit more here on the questions before we end. Peggy was sharing that you know each case is different. Um, somebody, mm -hmm. you know, her child goes in and out of favorites, which is absolutely something. And, and, and he will. He'll yeah. continue to do that. And he may continue to do that his whole life. Mm -hmm. And he may continue to do that until he finds his absolute favorite and sticks with it. Uh, what uh, tips or advice do you have for friends or teachers or caregivers? Oh, well, not caregivers, but more about teachers and friends, people that interact with individuals on the autism spectrum, maybe, you know, like at school or at work. Mm -hmm co-workers develop a language with them don't mm -hmm. assume that what they're saying is the way that you take it uh -huh. ask questions is this what you meant by that or what did you mean by that um i just got done moderating a panel for differentbrains.org very interesting there was a, a gentleman on the spectrum who works for google and his boss, who was neurotypical, and they've worked together for 20 years, and they talked about their journey of butting heads at the beginning and developing their language to where they could communicate together mm -hmm. and work well together. Wow. So I would say develop a language between the two of you. It, it could be any different type of thing, but develop a way that you two can communicate and understand each other. That's wonderful. And and not just assuming, like you said, that they're they meant to be offensive or, or, or they meant something by something asking first. Right. And, and that goes for romantic relationships with mm -hmm. parents, with friends, social groups, school, yeah. any type of relationship. That's awesome. Wow. And as we're wrapping up here, I just want to, uh, you know, share with those who maybe have caught us later, um, you know, JR is a self-advocate uh, as an adult uh, on the autism spectrum, and he shared so much uh, insight for us and some humor along the way. Um, okay. Yes. Yes, you try. And you're, you're great. Um, but uh, one of the big things uh, that you shared was, um, you know, knowing who your child is, giving them space to be that. Um, also, you talked about, you um, uh, it's for parents having some some me time, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you have some time in there for self care, um, and and so many other things that that you've shared with us today. So, uh, Jr., if there are those who are listening who want to uh, contact you and learn more about your story or how they can help or where they can find you next, um, how can they contact you? 
Uh, well, right at the bottom where it says not weird, just autistic.com is the best place. Okay. They can find links to my social media there. They can find an events page there. Uh, they can find uh, links to where I'm speaking, to consulting, to blog posts, to pretty much whatever I'm up to that's not personal. All right. Perfect. <laughs> You've learned not to, sit, not to blur those things together. <laughs> yes, I have. Yes, I have. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, great. And so, and you did share that you're going to have a new podcast coming up. So that's I have a new podcast. Um, for those who are listening, uh, who do follow social media, uh, Lyric Holmans, who's known across social media as the neurodivergent rebel is going to be my co-host. Uh, the podcast is examining neurodiversity and we're going to look at not just autism, but dyslexia, uh, dyspraxia, ADHD, bipolar, anything that makes up neurodiversity. And we're going to talk about how it's not just us versus them, but how we can make it we. Oh, man, that sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. So especially those of you who are listening to this podcast, make sure you check out this upcoming podcast with JR. Yeah. And, and, and again, you can subscribe to the newsletter at the bottom of every page on Not We're Just Autistic, and you will get updated on when that starts. We're recording our first podcast tomorrow, and it should start in late May. Awesome. So exciting. Well, uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. This has been so great. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for such a long time. I know, me too. Oh my gosh, so exciting. I think I need to have a part two. We got to come together again. Oh, we'll do it. We'll do <laughs> yeah. it because you asked me for funny stories and I had two. So, oh, you know, yeah. we never got to those. So we can do funny stories as part two. Oh, good. Awesome. We'll do <laughs> funny stories, humor and autism show. Or something like that. Yeah. That'd Standing in front of 1,500 people at the state capitol. <laughs> wow. Wow. First of all, not many even neurotypical people would have been able to do that. Um, yeah. So kudos well, to you. Do we have just one minute? Sure. Go for it. Go okay. for it. So it was uh, Developmental Disability Legislative Rights Day. Um, it was for advocates and self-advocates to talk to their legislators. Uh, there were 12 people speaking. We each had five minutes. I was the only non-legislator besides the governor. Um, and I closed it out. And I remember walking up on stage and saying, so I've got social anxiety, don't like large crowds, don't like loud random noise, yet here I am. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I found that with the social anxiety, if I focus on the message mm -hmm. and what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. it makes it a whole lot easier. Wow. That's so good. And that just brings so much hope, which is a piece of what I love to offer in this show. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's hope. There's hope for anybody. Everybody can learn. Everybody can thrive in their own way. And you're a living example of that, JR. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate that. Well, thank you guys again for listening to another episode of Thriving Special Families. I'm your host, Crystal Sanford. And always remember, parents, you're going to be okay and your child's going to be okay too. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.